continuing on with the story of La Casas. Um, and more and more you notice that this story is just all about La Casas. Uh, and, and that's kind of the way that I've structured it. You know, it started out as kind of like, okay, start talking about the history of Spanish colonialism in some kind of general way, but more and more it's just focused on the experience and the witness of La Casas. Uh, because again, he becomes this iconic figure of um, trying to protect the human rights of indigenous people in the Americas. And uh, right at the beginning of colonialism, you know, this is not an afterthought. It wasn't like, oh, we didn't notice. It's like, no. You had La Casas there at the beginning complaining, telling the kings and the queen, this is wrong, right from the start. And he just does not relent. He just keeps at it. Um, all right. <clears throat> So we have Sepulveda creating some kind of casistry sort of argument for just war, which just means it's not a war. A war is between two armies that are equal in power, that are fighting against each other. If you have one power that just wipes out the other, it's not a war, it's genocide. Um, so the whole idea of just war just doesn't apply. Um, Okay, but Sepulveda does gain some kind of popularity because there is so much invested interest, money, in colonization. Um, at this time, back in, you know, uh, La Casas is back in Spain. Uh, he has effectively gotten the new laws on the books, but enforcing them is not happening. Uh, but nonetheless, he still has some uh, political clout and he's made Bishop of Chiapas in, in Mexico. So he's consecrated in Spain. And then uh, 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 about this time, he starts to write and um, largely completes the apologetic history of the Indies, which is uh, originally just one of the chapters of his history of the Indies that I discussed earlier, uh, but uh, becomes an entire book in and of itself. And he calls it the apologetic history of the Indies because it's, it's not just a historical narrative. He's really, arguing uh, and an apologetic uh, uh, apologetics is the defense of in particular within the medieval context apologetics is the defense of the faith is defense of Christianity and so when he says that it's an apologetic history it's the defense of a Christian understanding of the history of the Indies, that uh, if you have any Christian understanding of the reality of the world, this is the understanding. And of course, what he shows is that the indigenous Americans are fully human, and they're even fully civilized within the notions of civilization of Europe you know, the Aztecs and the Peruvians, uh, the Incas had major cities and, um, you know, all sorts of urban lifestyle and, you know, a high standard of living and, and all these things on any measure. 
they would be considered uh, civilized. Of course, they dress different from Europeans, but um, that wasn't any indication of a lower standard of living or you know anything uh, objective that would indicate them as of lower status. And um, and so he makes that argument, and it's a, and it's an argumentative text. So it's an apologetic, argumentative history against Sepulveda. Okay. Uh, so he was aware and maybe had read Sepulveda's text and is arguing against that um, in a concerted way. Although he was consecrated in 1544, he didn't reach Chiapas. You know, he's consecrated in Spain and then goes back to Chiapas um, in early 1545. Uh, and then in March, not long after he arrives, he writes a pastoral letter. And in it, he's very aggressive. He indicates that he will refuse absolution to any encomendero unless they dismantle their encomendera, like in their will, like absolution uh, is the right of uh, forgiveness at the time of death. So when people are dying, they call for a priest to give them their last confession. This is absolution. And he's saying that he will withhold absolution on their deathbed unless they swear as a legal contract that they will give up their encomendera, that they will not um, they will not will their encomendera to their descendants. So he's He's saying, we're going to end this now. And then the land and the people will become uh, direct vassals of the king. According, you know, and this is like a central concept is that he wants to eliminate all this pyramidal structure of feudal vassalage and have indigenous Americans be direct vassals of the king, which would raise their status in the feudal order quite dramatically. Um, and he is confident that they could uh, fulfill that duty, which is, <clears throat> which is uh, very consistent with Marxist ide uh, ideology. The idea that uh, laborers in a factory could themselves run a factory. Now you may think that's ridiculous. And you may think it's ridiculous that indigenous um, Americans could, uh, could run uh, a farm. That could sound ridiculous to you. Um, but there are people who have a different view. And so that's part of the argumentation in this course is, do you think that's ridiculous? Indigenous people of America running their own farms and paying tribute to the king? Ridiculous? Factory workers running the factory? Ridiculous? That's the question. So, um, so again, um, Lacasas stands out as this kind of model of a revolutionary thinker. I mean, he tries to implement uh, his strategies, but is not very success successful. But his ideas are revolutionary, uh, utopian, even in the model of Thomas More. But um, but can you argue against it? Are indigenous people so ill-equipped 
that they cannot be farmers and pay some sort of portion directly to the crown? Do they need levels and levels of feudal vassalage? And do the factory workers need levels and levels of management and ownership in order to run a factory successfully? Or do you think, I mean, are factory workers that incompetent that they can't do it? That's a good question. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a big question that we're asking. Lacassus believes that indigenous people are not less than Europeans. Um, and so he stands out as, as this extraordinary person because, you know, uh, many people, even if they somewhat believe that indigenous people were human, they weren't entirely convinced. Could they really do it? They may not, they just don't, they're, they're not as intelligent as white people. You know, and, and there's a lot of racist ideology that goes along with that. So, um, so he tries to implement, according to his thinking, his ideology. And let's not pretend that it's not ideology. He, he has some vision. He has a utopian vision that indigenous people could govern themselves. Um, maybe he's wrong. Maybe you'll argue against that. That indigenous people are not capable of governing themselves. That they're somehow genetically, I don't know, um, inferior. But Lacassus doesn't believe that. And he doesn't believe that from his experience. And he doesn't believe that uh, based on his religious understanding, religious ideology. Um, so he refuses to any encomendero to give them their last rights before they die if they don't promise to give up their land to the indigenous people, which would in effect institute the new laws, which are still on the books. <clears throat> uh, he also threatened to excommunicate anyone who was grossly abusing indigenous people, that he would just personally excommunicate them. So he publishes this in a letter, 1545. By October, the king, Charles, repeals the new laws. And in, in the wake of that, as it as the news filters into Chiapas and the surrounding areas, the Uncomienderos riot and they even resort to shooting at La Casas. So he is, uh, you know, he is being harassed in the extreme. And um, I think I mentioned earlier, like through the fog of history, it seems like, oh, you know, is La Casas being persecuted to the degree that uh, Father Romero was. Um, here we see that, you know, he's directly under threat of death. Um, and in the midst of this, uh, in January of 1546, he flees to Mexico City. Uh, and then, um, and then spends a year there, you know, so he's there for almost a year. Um, at the end of the year, he appoints a vicar to 
uh, take over his duties at Chiapas to be the person on the ground. And um, he does agree to some uh, accommodation of the Encomendero's uh, point of view, uh, maybe for the vicar. But at the same time, he issues his uh, Confacionero, which is um, which is like rules on the sacraments. So this is like his official pronouncement of the way that being bishop of Chiapas, and we'll see this with Romero, where he has these like pastoral letters that he issues, and then this is like doctrine for the territory that that he's in charge of, and so. Uh, La Casas issues this um, confessionario that that is uh, you know like doctrine for his um, parish that he is bishop or, over, and it's rules on the sacraments and you know this is marriage and death and birth um, sort of things and all the, the ceremonies that go along with that. Uh, and in it, he refuses absolution, you know, uh, last rites, the, the final confession uh, of a person if they are unrepentant to uh, the encomenderos, if they won't give up their land when they die. Like that's the, and so, <clears throat> Um, again, he's holding to the new laws now after they've already been repealed almost a year earlier. Uh, or more than a year earlier. <laughs> um, and so uh, with that, after issuing this um, pronouncement, he leaves for Spain and, and he never returns to Chiapas. He's still Bishop uh, of Chiapas, but he's an absentee Bishop with a vicar, you know, sort of on the ground running things. Um, <clears throat> okay, so around this time we have uh, Pedro de la Gasca um, is appointed president of the Royal Audience, the uh, Supreme Court within New Spain within the colonies, which Mexico is part of. Peru is a, a different administrative district. Uh, uh, but maybe, I, I'm not sure, maybe the Royal Audience still does apply there, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, but definitely within New Spain, um, where Chiapas is located. Uh, now, he is personally appointed to go to Peru and put down the Pizarro rebellion. So Gonzalo Pizarro is still in rebellion in Peru, um, <clears throat> claiming to be king of Peru, independent of Spain. And uh, to do so, he, he is given no army. So he's expected to do this purely on the basis of his diplomatic skills. And um, he arrives in Peru in 1546 and fairly immediately does convince a lot of uh, Pizarro's um, uh, officers, you know, rank, high ranking. Uh, members of his military, a rebel military, to come over to the Spanish crown, um, you know, on promises of, of uh, 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 of immunity, you know, further crimes, and and um, and this is extended very broadly to everyone that will come over and join the kingdom. 
uh, against Pizarro, and that's fairly effective. And once he gets the the commanders, especially of the Navy, um, now uh, Lagasca has has a Navy at his disposal and is able to use force uh, to implement these things and um, is, is pretty effective. So he, he actually comes in without an army, acquires a Navy through diplomatic skill, and then continues to enforce order of the uh, Spanish crown throughout Peru. Uh, but Pizarro does flee and continue to fight um, uh, guerrilla warfare uh, against the crown. And in the midst of this, uh, La Casa returns to Spain. Okay. <clears throat> now, when he gets to Spain, the Confessionaro immediately brings ac accusations of treason against La Casas because King Charles was himself a slave owner. There had been, um, there had been uh, military campaigns in Africa where uh, large thousands, uh, tens of thousands of Africans had been enslaved by military force. And uh, this is all under the the guise of those papal bulls that I discussed earlier. And so King Charles himself, um, as you know, uh, the conquistadors who conducted this retained most of the slaves, but a portion of those slaves were then uh, devoted, you know, as tribute and vassalage, you know, feudal vassalage to uh, King Charles himself, and so King Charles himself owned a large number of slaves, and the content of the Confessionaro implicated King Charles as not deserving of absolution. <laughs> and so, um, La Casas was implicated as being treasonous. Uh, which he probably, in fact, was. Well, you know, let's be clear about that. Um, so in in the wake of this controversy, Charles orders all copies of the Confessionario to be burnt. So there's public book burnings of La Casas's work. And La Casas uh, then responds by writing two treaties on just title, like just title to property. And, and when we say property, we mean primary land property, not money property or some abstract property, but land, uh, what we call real property, real estate. Um, and in these two treatises, uh, La Casas argues that just title to lands in, America, in the Americas could only be conferred by peaceful conversion and submission of the indigenous people. So if the indigenous people could be reasoned with and converted to Christianity and uh, incorporated into, assimilated into Spanish society, then the king could have just title to those lands and anyone down further in, in the pyramidal feudal structure could have just title to those lands. But if not, no, that the indigenous people had to agree to the contract. And so he argues specifically, and, and he does mention Sepulveda um, and his work, another Democritus that I talked about earlier, 
he mentions Sepulveda's work specifically and argues against it specifically, explicitly. Around this time, there's a big issue in Peru. Uh, Lagasca uh, repeals the new laws. So when Lagasca gets there, he's successful at acquiring the Navy and then implementing by force some uh, acquiescence of the population and grants lots of pardons and is fairly successful, but Pizarro is still out in the mountains waging guerrilla warfare. Um, but in the midst of this, he repeals the new laws. And this is a big blow to La Casas because the new laws were his, uh, were his baby, okay. And, um, Now, Lagasca does institute some laws to rein in the, the most severe abuses of encomienda, um, but he's fairly, he's fairly um, sympathetic to, to the encomienderos. You know, this is part of his diplomatic strategy, and in part he um, he presents to the crown, to Charles, the offer of the encomenderos to pay significant amounts of money for the land grants, to, for them to own the property in perpetuity, to actually buy the property outside of vassalage, right? This is now total breakdown of feudal order. Um, and Emperor Charles is inclined to accept the offer because he needs the money. Um, <clears throat> and La Casa is actually in, you know, in uh, proximity and talking with Charles personally. So again, La Casa is somehow, through all this turmoil, is still legitimate enough to get an audience with the king, to, to speak to the king person to person, face to face, and plead, you know, his case, and uh, he still has a lot of legitimacy. He's just one of these uh, people that is a rabble rouser, that is, uh, you know, antagonistic, but nonetheless is able to maintain legitimacy in the midst of it. And, um, and he argues with the emperor, saying that, you know, uh, arguing that he should not accept the money payments. Um, and uh, Gonzalo Pizarro is ultimately defeated in his rebel movement, and Gasca returns to Spain. He's a big hero, lots of fanfare. Uh, given honors and titles. I think he was made a bishop. Um, and then uh, Charles, Emperor Charles, never makes a decision on accepting those payments. Okay, so it just kind of fades away. Uh, maybe because of the influence of La Casas. We don't know. But uh, about this time, Charles orders a cessation of all military expansion until the now popular question of just war against the indigenous Americans is settled. Is Sepulveda's just war argument uh, legitimate or is La Casas, uh, is his argument legitimate? Um, La Casas has managed with his two trees to create enough of a public controversy that then Charles uh, assembles a panel of judges to hear the case uh, between Sepulveda and La Casas. And this is known as the uh, Valladolid debate. Valladolid is the capital city in Spain 
And so uh, this is the big event, really, in La Casas's life, um, this Valladolid debate. This is where he gets his highest sort of public notoriety. Um, but we've seen, like, he, he has managed to be fairly successful at maintaining a diplomatic political prominence in the midst of a lot of defeats. Uh, but here, his level of notoriety really just escalates to a whole other level and, and really becomes part of the popular consciousness of Spanish society. And this is in 1550. Um, Columbus landed in the Americas in 1492. And now we're 60 years later, which is a relatively, historically speaking, that's a relatively short amount of time. We're now having the Valladolid debate on the question of the humanity of the indigenous Americans. And it's a big, high profile uh, cultural event. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to stop things here, and then I'll, I'll talk about that in the next video.